Amen. Are you ready to get in the Word? All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this day. We give you praise and honor and glory. Father, we ask you that the Holy Spirit of the living God would lead us, guide us. Open our eyes and our ears to see and to hear and receive the engrafted Word of God that will cause us to mature and to grow. Father, you are the voice of many waters. I just pray that you will take the Word today and speak to every one of our hearts in whatever area that needs to be spoken to. And Father, we just ask you in the name of Jesus that you would open the eyes of our understanding, that Father, that we may know and understand and come to the knowledge of the revelation of your word in these days that we're living in. Help us to see and to understand. Open our hearts to receive, Lord God. And I just pray that we will be hungry for your word, Father. We'll be passionate for your word and will not become apathetic. Father, we'll not, we'll not compromise in any way, shape, or form, but we will stand firm in these last days, knowing that your return is at hand. We give you the praise and honor and glory, glory for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Of course, we've been doing a series on hope, and today I want to talk to you about hope's door. I want you to turn to Hosea, the second chapter, Hosea chapter 2. Amen. And we're going to be reading with verse 14. Verse 14, Hosea chapter 2, you may have to go to the front of your Bible to find where it is. I used to do that, so don't feel bad about it. Amen. Hosea chapter 2, verse 14, therefore, behold, this is God speaking. He said, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will give her vineyards from there and the valley of Acre as a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days of when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. And I will take from her her mouth the names of the Baals, And they shall be remembered by their name, and they shall be remembered by their name no more. When we come into this this place and we're reading this, we found out that if you if you read previously to this, you'll find out that Israel has turned away from God. She's actually gone after the Baals. She's after gone after other gods. She's gone after what the Bible says and what God calls after other lovers, like an adulteress or adulterer. Matter of fact, if we read back over, and you don't have to turn there, let me just read, but, but over in verse 13, if we backed up, it says, For the days of Baals to which she burned incense, she decked herself with earrings and jewelry, and she went after her lovers. What was the result? What was the end result of her going after these other lovers? But me, God says, she forgot, says the Lord. So what she's done is this. This did not happen to Israel overnight. And this is why you and I, in this culture and society that we're living in, we have to be very, very careful. She, Israel, she has allowed the prevailing sin of the culture and other nations that don't serve God to literally influence her. And she now has embraced a behavior and a lifestyle that is completely opposite of the life that God has called her into. She's still acting religious. She's still having festivals. She's still bringing offerings. But now she's doing it with the wrong heart. She's doing it in the wrong way. Now it's basically something to do externally. And by the way, they never did get into the place that they fully just threw God out. They allowed they allowed these lovers, they allowed the this culture and what was the, 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 the things in the culture to come into their lives. And what they did is they added this to their life. But in adding it to their life, they allowed their affections and their passion for these things to become more predominant in their lives than their love for God. So she was still acting religious, but she's drifted away from her affectionate relationship with God. And... Not only that, after a period of time, her love for God had grown cold. You know, the Bible 
tells us that we as Christians, we have to put a guard on our hearts. We have to be very careful, lest the same thing happen to us. In uh, Hebrews, the second chapter, verse 1, listen to this scripture. He says, therefore, we must give, give more earnest heed. Everybody say more. More earnest heed to the things we have heard. Not only have heard, but the things we continue to hear. See, when it says we must give earnest heed to the things that we have heard, that's the reason it's so important that you're in a place that's going to teach you the Word of God. But when the Word of God is being taught with substance and with depth to it, you need to, you need to recognize and realize that we don't need to be hearers of the Word. You can't just come to a Sunday ser service and be sermonized. You can't come here just because, okay, I'm saved and now I'm supposed to go to church. No, we come to church because we need to hear the Word of God and we need to be, di we need to be discipled. And then we take what we have learned and we act upon that Word. We don't just hear it, but see, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And as the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God, the Word that you're getting right now, the Word that you'll get this morning, the Holy Spirit will bring that back to your remembrance. The Holy Spirit will begin to teach you. That's one of the reasons that I take all my notes and I put them up on the website. So that you can download those notes. You can go up and see them anytime that you want to go see them. Why? Because I want you to be able to study this out. Because I want you to lay a foundation in your life. Because if you don't lay, lay a foundation in your life, you're going to be like that house that we saw on television just the other night in Canada where that flood came and that house is just sweeping down, going down the river because it was swept right off its, its foundation and then it hit the bridge and totally, completely destroyed the whole house. Well, do you know Jesus said the same thing in Matthew the 7th chapter? That if we don't have a firm foundation in our lives that we can literally be destroyed. You know, the Bible says this, that God said, my people, right here in Hosea, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But James takes it a little bit farther over in the book of James in the New Testament. He says, don't be hearers of the word. Don't just listen to it, but do it. Do what it says to do. And it says, if you're a doer of the word and not just a hearer, you will be blessed. So here's what he says. Therefore, we must give more earnest heed to the things we've heard, least we drift away. We don't want to drift away. How do you drift away? You know, I was raised up fishing, so I know when you pull the anchor up, you're going to drift. You're going to kind of drift and you're going to fish a little bit. As long as you got the anchor down, you're not going to drift. The anchor of our soul is Jesus Christ. It is the Word of God. It is the hope that we have in God. And as long as I'm anchored in Him, I'm not going to drift alone. I'm not going to be blown about by every wind of doctrine that comes. That's the reason that it's so important for our Wednesday night discipleship classes. It's been the reason we have so many classes and the reason that we teach and we continue to do that. Because our desire here at Covenant Love for you to be strong representatives and ambassadors of the kingdom of God. You to be strong and you're not going to be swept away by every wind of doctrine. You're going to be strong and when the devil comes to knock on your house, he's going to find out that he wished he'd have gone to the house next door. He wished that he would not knocked on your door because you're going to be there with a the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith and you're not going you're going, to, you're going to know what to do and how to apply it. Now, Jesus made a statement too. Here's a statement we need to look at. It's very important that we understand what Jesus said. Because here the disciples has asked Jesus, what are going to be the signs of the time before you come back? Now, if you read that in Matthew, the 24th chapter, you will find out that every single sign that Jesus gave is happening right now in multiples. In multiples. He said, there's going to be a lot of people out deceiving you saying they are the Christ. They're, they're Jesus. Well, Kanye West, his latest album cover, he's on a cross. He's proclaiming himself as the Messiah. Isn't that amazing? And tons of young people are listening to him preach his gospel. Isn't it amazing? See, this is what happens with deception, ladies and gentlemen. You don't start out like that, but you end up like that as you give yourself over to listening to the kingdom of darkness and operating inside 
of the kingdom of darkness. But now listen to what Jesus said about the last days. In Matthew 24, verse 12, he said, this is just one of many, I'm just picking this one out. He said, and because lawlessness, that basically means immorality, sin, wickedness, because lawlessness will abound, it's going to be, that word abound means superabundant. Lawlessness is going to be superabundant. He said, the love of many will grow cold. But he endures to the end shall be saved. Now, it's very important that we understand what that word coal means. It means this. The, the word coal in verse 12 means to chill. Not like you've been working all day and you come home and you just chill out. That's not what it's talking about. The word cheer, chill here, here's the definition. It means a cooling down of an original temperature. The cooling down. See, when you take something out of, the, out of the oven and you decide that you're going to keep it for another day and you want to freeze it, what do you do? You take it, it's warm, it can be hot, you put it in the freezer. Now, as long as that, whatever you put in there, stays in that environment long enough, it eventually will become frozen. Correct? It doesn't become frozen the moment you put it in there. The moment you put it in there, it begins to be chilled down. The temperature of the product that you put in there, the, the, the environment that you put it in, has an effect upon it. And the effect is, it's going to chill it. It's going to, to eventually freeze it. If you stay in that environment and never protect yourself, you stay in a chilled environment. Sooner or later, it's going to have a major effect upon you. See, when Israel was delivered out of bondage and slavery out of Egypt, I mean, they were on fire for God. I mean, they were praising God. They were writing songs. It was just amazing what happened. But the culture that they allowed themselves to be in, the culture began to gradually allure them away from God, and gradually they chilled out. The culture and the characteristics of our society today, apart from God's ways, have been designed to steer and to take you and I away from God. The culture that, is, that has been produced today, the culture that we see today, has the demonic influence that causes you and I to love the world and all that it has to offer and to turn away from the loving God who, who, who He is, turn away from His commandments and stop us from being a godly influence in this culture. That's what the culture is designed for. That's what it has been designed for. In 1 John, the second chapter, verse 15, here's what God tells us. Do not love the world. Now, he didn't say that I can't enjoy things in the world. You understand that? He didn't say that. He said, don't love the world. Don't be more passionate and more affectionate and let the world have your heart apart, uh, uh, above me. He said, do not love the world or the things in the world. What it just says right there, that the world and the things in the world... You have to be very careful because it will cause you to grow cold. It will cause you to chill out. It will, it will take your affection and, a passion, and passion away from God. The, he said, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Notice that all of that is external. That's how the devil works. The devil works from the outside to come in. Okay? God comes inward and then he works outwardly to help you in your life he says so the lust of the flesh the, l the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but is of the world and the world is passing away and the lust of it but he who does the will of God everybody say the will of God every he who does the will of God abides what forever so in, Hebrew, in Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 12, and when you're looking at that, it states that the love of many will grow cold. Now, what does this mean? What does it mean, really, the love of God? 
What, what does it tell us? What does the Bible tell us about concerning when, that when we say we love God? Let's, let's look at that. In John the 14th chapter, J- Jesus actually gave us the definition in many passages of, of Scripture here in the Bible. He said this, if you love me, how many of you love Jesus? Let me say, yeah, you love Jesus, okay? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments, correct? All right, let's look at verse 21. Jesus said, he who has my commandments and keeps them, everybody say, keeps them, it is he who loves me. Now watch this, what he says. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. In other words, the manifestation of Jesus in our lives, in our homes, everywhere we go, everything that we do, the manifestation comes that when we say we love him, that we will obey him. Not that we, you know, not, not that we're perfect and we do that every single time. Every one of us have missed it. Every one of us have made mistakes before. But the fact is, if I love God, I will be quick to repent. I'll be quick to ask him to forgive me. So, so again, look, he said, he who has my commandments, and we have the word of God, it is he and keeps him, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And then in verse 23 and 24, Jesus again said, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. That means the word of God. We have the word of God. We have the Bible, the word of God, especially the New Testament, which is the new covenant which we we are under as as born-again believers. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. In other words, when I'm faced with a situation to obey God or not, what I'm looking at is whatever is there in front of me, I make a decision whether I'm going to love that more than I'm going to love God. When a person is in front of me trying to get me to disobey God, to do something that's completely, totally out of God's will. I have to make a decision. Do I want to love that person more than I love God? Anytime that I make a decision that I'm going to love the thing or the person more than I love God and make a decision that is out of the will of God, I am going to suffer consequences. That's all there is to it. We're going to suffer consequences. Okay? Why? Because the Bible says God shall not be mocked. Does that mean that God doesn't love us anymore? Absolutely not. God loves us to pieces. That's the reason he's given us his word. So, so, so when, when I make a decision to do that, the Bible says that God shall not be mocked. Whatever a man sows in the flesh, that shall he reap. The Bible knows that. And that's the reason that God has given us his word. So that as we study God's Word, as we learn God's Word, that we store that up in our hearts. We renew our minds to the way God wants us to act, to think, and the way He wants us to act. As we store that up, and something or someone comes before us that is, I know that is out of God's will, that I know is not God's will for my life. See, if, if, if somebody... If somebody from my past or somebody even in my future texts me on my phone that is a female or comes up on my Facebook, oh, I'm going to dismantle their face. I'm not going to let them on my Facebook. I'm not going to let them. And and if I see something on a text, I'm a married man. Not only am I a married man, but I I am a son of God. I represent God. I'm a child of God. I want to bring honor and glory to God's name. I don't want to dishonor God's name. And and the fact is, just because I may be sitting in my car and something comes up, and I look around and nobody else is around, Tava's not around, my children are not around, nobody in the congregation's around, my pastors are not around, my board members are not around, nobody's there, so I can do that. God is right here. He's right there. So I need to make a decision. And here's what the devil does. The devil will stir up your flesh. 
Oh, you'll see that, and all of a sudden there are impulses. Things will start happening, especially if you're having trouble in your marriage. Especially if something's going on. That's the reason that the Bible tells us, what are we supposed to do? The Bible gives us, we are to guard our heart. Protect ourselves, guard our heart. And we are to make sure that we are to guard our eyes. I mean, it's impossible today to watch television hardly and not see something pop up that's crazy. You know, even Victoria's Secret is on television now. It is no secret anymore. It is out. And yet at the same time, everybody can tell you at our house, we're sitting there with a controller. Usually it's me because men have got to be in charge of controllers. I didn't see one lady, and there's no ladies. Everybody is staring at me like cold water, going, okay, it's just a man thing, okay? Anyway, anyway, my wife can do it. She can hold the controller for a second. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, but everybody knows at my house that when commercials come on, we have it set to the Weather Channel or some other place. And as soon as it comes on, if it's not a good commercial, boom, it's off. It's gone. Why? Because I don't want my eyes seeing it, and I don't want my kids' eyes seeing it. Okay? So, because I love my kids. I love my family. So I don't, I don't want them to, to see that thing. All right? So we have to make a decision what we're going to do when it comes to understanding the will of God. What are we going to do? And, and here's what he says. He says, he who does not love me does not keep my words. That doesn't mean that when you've made a mistake, and every one of us has, that you don't love God. Okay? I know that you love God. I know that you had the love of God in your heart. But what happens is, is that you take God and put him in the secondary. And put that which your flesh wants in the primary. And all of us have made mistakes. All of us have done things like that. But I found out in my life that as long as I will make that decision and speak it out of my mouth, and by the way, you also own your own feet. You can walk away and walk away and walk away and turn and walk away from anything that you desire to turn and walk away from. Some of us some of us, we have allowed our flesh to literally take over in areas of our life and do things that we hate, we, we really don't like, and we, we, we feel very sorry for it. You know, and we've asked God to forgive us. But here's the one thing that you've got to understand, is that when you do that, do you think the devil's going to leave you alone? He's going to try to condemn you and condemn you and condemn you and beat you up and beat you up and beat you up as much as he can. Because he knows now that you've repented of something that you have done. But he knows that if he can bring condemnation in your life, he can still cripple you. He can continue to depress you. He can continue to keep you in a place where you're, you're not going to advance or you don't feel worthy to do anything any, anymore for the kingdom of God. That's a ploy of the devil. That is not God, that is the devil, because the devil is the accuser of the brethren. Can you say amen? So therefore, Jesus is concentrating on, on, the, on the will of God. So in verse 31, he says this. Now, now, this is incredible scripture. But that the world may know that I love the Father. That the world, people around me, the culture, everybody around me, know. How will they know that I love the Father? Not just by saying things. Because I hear people say things all the time and their lifestyle does not line up with what they say. Okay? Don't, don't, tell me what, don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you believe. Amen? And so, so, so you can quote the scripture back and forth. So can the devil. The devil quoted the scripture to Jesus. Okay? But it's not just quoting the scripture. So, some, of the, <laughs> some of the craziest people I've ever met in my life uh, could quote scripture left and right, quote scripture more than I could quote scripture. But their lifestyle and their behavior was something totally different. So he said, 
He said, but that the world may know that I love the Father as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Amen? Then in 2 John, the first chapter, verse 6, it says, this is love. Everybody say, this is love. This is love that we walk according to His commandments. And this is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. That basically is the Word of God. Now, let me ask you this. Most of you know this answer. But who is the designer of this world system and our culture that we find today with all of its influence? Say it out loud. Satan Satan is, the devil. Luke, the fourth chapter, verse 5, when Jesus is being tempted. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned? Adam had authority in all the world, in in the earth. God had given it to him. And so therefore, when Adam sinned, he gave all that authority over to the devil. The devil shows up to tempt Jesus, just like he did with Adam. Of course, here he finds a man that does not keep silent. Adam kept silent during the temptation. Jesus does not keep silent. Jesus opens his mouth and confesses and speaks the Word of God. When you are faced with temptation and you're faced with other things, don't you keep silent. The more you keep silent, the more that temptation and those things that are affecting your flesh and and, and your mind and everything, the more they're going to build a stronghold. The more power that you give them. You cannot. You need to dismantle them. You need to disempower them. How do you do that? By speaking the Word of God. That's what Jesus did. And the Bible says, Then the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All of this authority I will give to you and their glory. Notice, the devil said, I've got authority over all the systems. I've got authority over all of the kingdoms and their glory. And by the way, the devil can also give it to any, anybody he wants to give it to. He can give it to every movie star. He can give it to every song artist. He can give it to every businessman. He can give it to whoever he wants to give it to inside this world, inside this culture. And if if those people become your heroes, you're barking up the wrong tree. You're following after the wrong place. You're going after the wrong person. He said, all of this authority I will give you, and their glory has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all of this will be yours. And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, away, Satan, get away from me. Rebuke Satan. The Bible says if we resist him, he has to flee. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, tells you exactly who the God of this world is. Little g. It's the devil. It's the demonic influences. It's the kingdom of darkness. That's the reason that so many of us were blinded to what I just said this morning about Jesus being the center, Jesus being uh, giving us eternal life. I was blinded to it. I didn't see it until somebody began to pray for me and until I got into a, uh, uh, an atmosphere where people had prayed and where the Word of God was being taught. Once I got into that atmosphere, the blinders came off my eyes And all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I could understand what was being said. And I was raised in church. It was having a a great influence on me. That is the reason that so many of us come to Saturday night prayer. Our night of of prayer from 6 to 7 on Saturday night. Why? Because we're giving that hour to pray for the people that are lost. We're giving that hour to pray for people that the blinders will come off of their eyes so they will be able to understand and see the gospel of Jesus Christ. You show me a church that does not have a lot of prayer, and I'll show you a church that has little power and little results. But you show me a a, a church that has a lot of prayer, and I'll show you a lot of results, and I'll show you a lot of power of, of God. Prayer is so vitally important. The Bible says, but if the but even if the gospel The good news about Jesus is veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds, now watch this, whose minds, the God of this world, or God of this age, which means world also, and also means the culture, the God of this culture, the God of this world, this age, has blinded who do not believe. Least the light, the understanding, the revelation of what Jesus has done should shine upon them. That's what we desire more than anything else, that people's eyes would be open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what are the effects of being chilled? 
What happens to us when we start to chill out and we lose our love for God, we lose our love for the Word, we lose our love for going to church like we used to be on fire and have a passion and look forward to getting there to praise and worship God? Well, here's, here's some of the things that happen. You gradually become discouraged. You also become standoffish. You become uncompanionable, unresponsive, withdrawn, unhappy, indifferent, distance. And then sometimes you become angry and very hostile. See, there's times in our lives with every single one of us in our walk with God that we allow other things and people and this culture to many times to distract us and gradually we find our hearts going into a different direction. I'm not praising God like I used to. I'm not hungry for the Word like I used to. I, I, I'm sitting there but I, my mind is racing and I, I got so many other things that I'm thinking about instead of concentrating and focusing on God's Word. All of a sudden now the service has become longer and longer and longer. Why? Because I'm not engaged spiritually the way I used to. I don't have the passion in the fire that I used to have. And I'm going to tell you, if things like that are happening to you, you better be very careful because you're beginning to chill out. The culture is beginning to have an effect, effect on you. And then we can see our relationship with God and literally coming to church beginning to cool off. Our hunger for God's Word begins to change. And we find ourselves desiring the things of this world and the relationships of this world more and more. And don't think that it can't happen to you. The Apostle Paul, it happened to a young man that was on his staff. His evangelistic staff. The young man got so caught up in what he was seeing in the things of this world, he literally left Paul. In 2 Timothy the 4th chapter verse 10, Paul says this when he's writing to Timothy. He says, For Damas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and departed for Damascus. Can you imagine walking with the Apostle Paul? Wow. Can you imagine walking with Jesus? Look what happened to Judas. That's the reason we have to, we have to guard our hearts. Many times... Our opinion or someone else's suggestions triumphs over what God has said. Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to word, God's Word, you and I don't have an opinion. Nobody has an opinion. No, you can't give your opinion to God. Well, God, you know, it's the 21st century and I, I think this is the way things should be done. That doesn't fly. We have God's Word. And God's Word tells us exactly what to do and how to live our life to be pleasing and to be blessed. If we allow ourselves to fall into that position, then things begin to fall apart. And then, here, here's the crazy thing that begins to happen. When we gradually get ourselves over into that relationship with the world and the things of this world, and things begin to fall apart, now we turn around, because we still come to church, but then we turn around and say, God, where are you? God, you've abandoned me. God, what are you doing in, 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 in all of this? Where are you? Well, he's never left us. We've walked away from him because of our actions, our lifestyles, and behavior has changed because we've made a choice to do that. And so, therefore, we begin to get to a place that once we get in and we leave God, we, we, he doesn't leave us, but we walk away from him. We start living a life that we're not supposed to live. We start doing things that we know is disobedience, uh, in disobedience to God. When that happens, we feel like that God has abandoned us, forgot us, and will never probably help us again. Now we get into a mess and we think, you know, God, God won't even forgive me anymore. We come under a vicious attack of condemnation from the devil and our own mind because we have drifted away from him, living in disobedience and just outdoing our own thing and, and, and living by our own opinions even though we know what God's word says. And then what happens? When you get into that position, that place, you begin to murmur and complain. You begin to blame other people and accuse others because of our demise. We will not take responsibility for our mistakes. So what do we do? We begin to point the fingers at other people. We begin to point fingers at our spouses. We begin to point fingers at the church. We begin to point fingers at our friends. It is amazing how this spiral begins to take place. See, when we get into the place that we are pursuing what is not God's will, living in disobedience and doing our own thing, it's going to propel each and every one of us into frustration. There will be emptiness in our life, loneliness. And by the way, people will come and promise you all kinds of things and say things to you to try to get you out of God's will. 
They will whisper in your ear. They will tell you all kinds of things about love and how they love you and care about you and all this kind of stuff. The moment, all they want is that gift that you have. That's all they want. For you, for you young men and young ladies, the gift that you have to give to your spouse, that's what they want. They want that gift. They want to take it. And they will promise you everything and tell you all kinds of things. But the moment something happens, where are they? What happens in your life? And there, there's been many of us that have gone through that and been hurt, frustrated, emptiness, loneliness. When you get away from God and you start doing your own thing and get out here and start embracing the culture, weariness begins to set in. Weakness, anger, discouragement. Never having enough to meet my needs, barely scraping by, despair, unhappiness. And most of the times, failure sets in. But ladies and gentlemen, I've got some great news for you this morning. Because Israel had gone completely astray from God. Completely astray. God says, I'm going to allure her back. Now, in the meantime, as she's doing her own thing, going her own way, she has become barren and desolate. In other words, she has lost. What she thought that she would gain by following the culture and society and... and embracing the Baals, the other gods, and just adding them to them, all of a sudden everything's coming up short right now. She's burning herself out. There's no joy, there's no peace. And matter of fact, now she has allowed her enemies to come in and begin to literally strip her and take things from her. That's what happens when we get over into enjoying the sin of this world. That's what happens when we allow the love of the world and the love of other things to come and take our, 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 our hearts away. But at that same time, let me bring you back to the condemnation. The condemnation comes heavy. The condemnation becomes strong. And then all of a sudden, we're beginning to look. Judgment is upon us right now because the wages of sin is death. And if I continue to do that, again, God is not mocked. I'm going to start reaping the things I'm sowing. And all of a sudden, I look at it and say, now I've blown it. I've messed up. I've really goofed up. You know, look at my failure. Look at what I've done. And then the enemy heaps on top of you, beating you up, beating you down. But let me tell you what God comes in to say. This is one of the most amazing love stories that is in the Bible. It's absolutely incredible. Even in this position in place, in James, the second chapter, verse 13, it says this. Listen to this. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Let me tell you this. God shows mercy. God will show mercy. And the Bible says, listen to this, mercy. Everybody say mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Listen to what Jeremiah said in Lamentations, the third chapter, verse 17. You have moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. Man, he is in a world of hurt. And he said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Remember my affliction and roaming, the wormwood and the gall, which basically is poison. And that's what this world has for us is poison. He said, my soul still remembers and sinks within me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Turn to somebody and say, have hope. Have hope. Listen, listen to what he says. He says, through the Lord's mercies, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. I just want to tell you right now, wherever you may be, wherever what may be going on in your life, he is not going to allow the enemy to consume you. We may be in a place where a lot has been consumed, but the moment you turn to him, the consuming and the chewing of the enemy comes to a halt, comes to a stop. He said, he, he said, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion and my soul. Therefore, I have hope in Him. 
I have hope in him. So now, real quickly, let's go back again to, to Hosea and look at what's happened here. Look what God is doing. This is what God is saying. Maybe you've been out there. Maybe you've made some mistakes. Maybe some things have fallen through the crack. Maybe you've gotten into what this world has to offer you. Maybe you've lost some of your passion and maybe you've lost some of your fire for God. But look what God does. God will not allow us to just be out there by ourselves. We can make the choice to be out there by ourselves. But I'm going to tell you this. God's going to do everything He can to get you back in the place where you're supposed to be. To get you in the place of protection. To get you in the place of blessing. To get you into a place where, where all of a sudden the enemy's mouth is shut up. Listen to what God said. To Israel in their place that they have left God. He said this. He said, therefore, behold, I will allure her. In other words, when you study that out, it means, he says, therefore, behold, he says, I'm going to surprise her. <laughs> I am going to surprise her. He is going to allure her by his mercy and compassion and unconditional love. And now watch this. He said, I will bring her into the wilderness. Now, she's already been in the wilderness, a spiritual wilderness, a barren wilderness, a desolate wilderness. That word there does not mean a barren, hot, dry place. The Hebrew word for the word wilderness here means pasture. He says, and, it, and listen, listen to what this word means. It means to commune, to get a word, to get a song. And to get a promise and a provision. This is not a place or a location or a position of punishment. But a place free from other distractions. A place to receive, receive mercy and grace and strength and restoration. Isn't that what God does? God will bring us into a service like this. Where we've been out here doing these things. We know it's wrong. We know it's not right. And, and now we've, we've paid a price for it. But all of a sudden we come back in, we know we need to be back in church. And all of a sudden we show back up at church. We come back in and what happens? Do you receive a word of punishment? No. Do you receive a word that beats you up and accuses you and, and, and bashes you over the head? No, you don't do that. You know what God does? God arranges everything to get you back into a place that He knows that you're going to receive a word of restoration. A word of encouragement. To get you back into the place. Isn't it amazing? It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. The goodness of God. So here, here they are. It's a place of mercy, grace, and strength and, re and, and restoration. And then he says this. He will speak comfort to her heart. That means this. That he will speak, speak friendly words and give wisdom. It means to transport, to carry one from one place to another. To carry away with the emotion of joy. Isn't it amazing how we're emotional, but then the emotion of joy comes when God says, I know you've made a mistake. I know you've done these things, but I love you, and I will forgive you, and I will restore you. Wow. All of a sudden, my emotion begins to change. Isaiah 61 Verses 1 through 3 tells us this. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of door of the prison to those who are bound. In other words, you've gotten yourself over here. You've gotten in this mess. You, you've walked away from God. You're bound up. You're in captivity. All kinds of things are happening because of disobedience and other things. But you know what God says? God says, I'm going to set you free. I'm going to deliver you. You've been bound up, but I'm going to set you free. And he's going to proclaim the acceptable year of God. God has not rejected you. God is not taking you out of your position and taking away from you your gifts and your callings. He's telling you, this is the acceptable year of the Lord. Listen to this. To comfort all who mourn. To console those who mourn in Zion. To give them... Boy, this is the great exchange. To give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they, may, that they may be called the trees of righteousness. Look what he says in verse 15 of Hosea 2. He said, not only that, I will give comfort to her. 
But I will give her vineyards from there. Vineyards. Man, this is amazing. That was their livelihood. Nothing is being produced right now. Nothing. They're in famine. They're losing everything. Just about lost everything. And you know what God comes back? God says, I'm going to give her vineyards from there. Where? Right in the middle of her greatest disaster. Right in the middle of her emptiness. Right in the middle of her barrenness. Vineyards. Because of her disobedience and sin, Israel had become desolate, barren. But now God was going to turn their barrenness into fruit and prosperity. And then, here's where we get to. And the valley of Acre as a door of hope. Wow. The valley of Acre. What is the valley of Acre? The, the word Acre in the Hebrew means the valley of trouble. He says, I'm going to go to her right in, in the middle of her valley of trouble, and I'm going to turn it into a door of hope. What does Acre represent? Where do we find that in the Bible? We find that in the Bible that the first time that we find Israel's first major defeat, their first defeat was, in, was basically in the valley of Acre. It was by a little teeny town called Ai. And the reason they were defeated was because a man by the name of Achan had gotten into disobedience. God told him, God told him, don't touch the gold, don't touch the silver. That belongs to me. Achan went out and he touched it and he disobeyed God. He took what God said not to take and it cost him his life and the life of his family. And they buried them and put them, put a heap of stones over them. And here's what God is saying to you right now. God's saying, I'm going to take your valley of defeat and I'm going to turn it into victory. After this incident... You find the children of Israel after this. They repented, asked God to forgive them. And then they went into where? They went into the promised land. So God is saying to each and every one of us today that if we've gotten into sin or disobedience, He said, I'm going to take your valley of trouble and defeat where you have stumbled and fallen. And I'm going to give you today a door of hope. I'm going to give you a door of opportunity to get out of that valley. So today, ladies and gentlemen, you need to leave the heap of stones that's been covering your mistakes and failures that you've been carrying around. You need to turn from the rubble that marks the failures of your past and you need to look to the door of hope that God himself is opening. And that door of hope is going to lead to restoration, healing, and deliverance, and prosperity. It's a door of new vision. It is a door of mercy, a door of grace, a door of, of, of forgiveness, a door of provision. And he says in verse 15, and she will sing there. God's going to turn your mourning into joy. He's going to give you beauty for ashes. And He's going to give you a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And I love this. He said, he said this. He said, and it shall be in that day, verse 16, says the Lord, they will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. Which my husband means restored relationship. Family relationship. Instead of my master, because what had happened is they got into the bales and they had become a slave to their circumstances because of disobeying God and turning from God and not doing His will. Every time we get into sin, every time we turn from God, every time we're disobedient to Him, we're going to become a slave to our circumstances. They're going to become our master. They're going to take over. But also he said this. He said, I'm going to take from the mouth of the names of Baals. I'm going to tell you, this is what God does for us. See, when we make a mistake, the devil will come and say, you're no good, you're worthless, you've messed up. You'll never make it. You're never going to accomplish anything. You're just an old sinner. You're, you're nothing. You're, you're, you're just no good. But see, the names of Baal have condemned us. Like names like failure, you're no good, stupid, worthless, bad, never amount to anything, always goofing up, nothing will ever work out, can't do anything right, everything goes wrong, I'm insignificant, always my fault. Not today! Not today! Because there is a door of hope in front of you. What kind of door does God open for you? It's not just saying just barely get by. Listen to Isaiah 61 verse 7. Instead of your shame, you will have double honor. Instead of confusion, they will rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. God's saying... You may have lost. You've made some mistakes. You've goofed up. You've gotten into disobedience. You got away from me. But today, I'm alluring you back. 
Today I'm calling you to come out of that place where you're at today. And walk in and I'm going to open a door for you. And the door, ladies and gentlemen, is Jesus. Jesus said in John 10, verse 9 and 10, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And will go in and go out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal. That's the devil. Kill and destroy. I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. It's time for you and I that regardless of the mistakes that we've made in our life, instead of pulling the cover over our eyes, instead of taking the condemnation and the accusation that the devil ha has, has given us, it's time for us to arise. It's time to arise out of your depression. It's time to arise out of your condemnation and realize that God's got great things still in store for you. That God can do great things in your life. That you still have a meaning and a calling and a gifting that we need in the body of Christ. We need for you to come out from under the covers. We need you to get out of the closet. We need you to get out of that darkness and arise like the Bible says. Listen, listen what the Bible says in Isaiah, the 60th chapter, verse 1 in the Amplified Bible. It says, arise from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Rise to a new life. Shine and be radiant with the glory of the Lord. For your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. I'm telling you, every single one of you that are in that place that you've messed up, you've goofed up, you've made mistakes, you've gotten over into sin, you've allowed the culture to pull you away, you don't have the passion and the fire that you used to have, and you, you know it in your life, I want to tell you right now, in this place today, there is an open door. God is opening the door for you. And you know what the Bible says? God opens a door that no man can shut. He closes a door that no man can open. But I'm going to tell you, the devil can't shut this door of restoration. He can't shut this door of forgiveness. He can't shut this door of mercy and grace. He can't shut it because Jesus has the keys. The devil does it. And he has the keys. And he wants you to arise into a new place. You say, Pastor, how do I do that? The Bible says very simple this. He said, if I repent and confess my sins before God, God is faithful that he will forgive me. The moment I am forgiven is the moment when I tell the devil to shut up. The moment I'm forgiven is the moment that that door opens and I walk through that door. My question is, are you going to stay on this side of the door? Are you going to stay on the side of door of condemnation and accusation? You're going to stay on the side of the door where the devil wants to continue to beat you up and steal from you and take from you? Or are you going to say, no, sir, I'm going to go all the way with God. I'm, I, I, I ask God to forgive me. I ask God to forgive me of all my sin. I ask God to forgive me for losing my passion, my fire for the things of God. And I ask Him to forgive me. And you know what God's doing? God is the one who has allured you here this morning. You think you got here just by accident? You didn't get here this morning. God pulled you into this place this morning. It's time for you to quit allowing the devil to beat you up. But it's also time to come out of any sin. It's time to put a stop to it. It's time to come out of disobedience to God. It's time to live in obedience to Him and walk in obedience. In making that decision, God opens the door. Great things can happen. Would you bow your head and close your eyes for just a second? I'm going to pray. And if that is you this morning, if you say, Pastor, that's me, that's where I am right now, I want to be in that prayer. Just slip up your hand all over the auditorium and say, Pastor, that's me. That's me. I want to be in that prayer this morning. I want to ask God to forgive me this morning. I want to get my life right. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. Yes, thank you. God bless you. See, He'll never force us to do anything. Yes, God bless you. Thank you. Yes, God bless you. Thank you. See, He won't do anything to force us to do anything. He just simply says, here's my goodness. Here's my love. Here's my grace and my mercy. And it's up to me. It's up to us to make that choice, 
to make the choice to do that. Anybody else before we pray? Yes, God bless you. Thank you. Anybody else? before? Yes, God bless you. Thank you. Anybody else? Say, Pastor, that's me. Anybody else before we pray? I'm getting ready to pray. Thank you. God bless you. Yes, all the way in the back, behind the audio booth. Thank you. Yes, right here. God bless you. Thank you. Yes, God bless you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Anybody else? Say, Pastor, that's me. That's me. I'm telling you, this is a great day. This is a great day. This is the day that the Lord has made. He made this. We didn't make it. Pastor Al didn't make it. He's the one that made it. He's the one that I just gave you His Word. Who else? Anybody else before we pray? I'm getting ready to pray. Anybody else? Thank you, ma'am. Yes, all the way back here. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anyone else before we pray? All right, all of you that raise your hands, I want you to raise them up high one more time. Just raise them up high to the Lord right now, all over this place. And I want you to pray this out loud with me. Father God, forgive me of all my sin. I repent in the name of Jesus. And I confess Jesus as Lord of my life. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. You see the mistakes that I've made. You see some of them right now that are right before me. But Lord God, I just give them to you. And I thank you that you allured me here this morning. I thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace that you love me. And this day, I rebuke all condemnation. I rebuke every word that has been spoken to accuse me in the name of Jesus. I now am cleansed and washed by the blood of the Lamb. And I am your child. And you are my Father. And I thank you now that I go forward. I arise out of depression and condemnation. And I go forward to complete my destiny. And fulfill what you have for my life. Father, your will be done in my life. In Jesus' name. And everybody sat. Amen. Come on, stand up. Give God praise in this place. Come on, give Him praise. Hallelujah. Oh, He's a God that is so wonderful. He's a God that is so merciful. He's a God of forgiveness. Hallelujah. And restoration. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.